My name is Chris Lowry. I'm very happy to introduce Dr. Ann Dunley from Woods Hole. Ann is a uh, assistant scientist at Woods Hole. She's been there. She started her postdoc there in 2016. We we're actually talking today. We have very similar career paths. Uh, she started her postdoc there in 2016, uh, and they liked her and hired her on permanently in 2018. And she's been there as an assistant scientist ever since. Before that, she got her PhD in earth sciences from Boston University and a bachelor's of science from the University of Rochester. Uh, Anne is a ocean discovery lecturer from the International Ocean Discovery Program. Uh, she's been really involved in scientific, scientific ocean drilling throughout her career, including sailing as an inorganic geochemist on Expedition 378 to the South Pacific, and uh, also as an inorganic geochemist on Expedition 346 to study the East Asian monsoon. Uh, today, she's going to talk to us about long-term trajectory of Earth's climate uh, and ocean chemistry. So, Anne, go ahead. Thank you. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Yeah, I was just saying this is the first talk I've been physically in person for a while, so it's great to be here. Um, all right, so it's to, to start off my talk, uh, you might be worried what this picture is of, but I can put you at ease. It's mud, it's marine sediment. <laughs> and this type of mud is going to help us answer this question that is posed in the title. I told you, we've tested this, and then it's not. <laughs> Uh, so this type of mud is uh, pelagic clay. Well, I guess first off, I'm a marine sediment geochemist and paleoceanographer, and this is my favorite type of marine sediment. It's pelagic clay. It's visually homogenous. It's like ooey brown, very fine grain. Uh, mineralogically, it's smectite, zeolite, and some iron oxides. Um, so very hard to tell like what's in it visually. Um, and a lot of paleoceanographers avoid this type of sediment like the plague because there's no microfossils, so it's very hard to date. It accumulates really slow sedimentation records, or sedimentation has really slow sedimentation rates, uh, so you can't get high resolution records. And it sits at the bottom of the seafloor for a long time and interacts with seawater, so everything gets altered. Uh, I think that those are three of those, the biggest assets of these clays. The slow sedimentation rates allow for really long uh, records of Earth's history. So we're going to be looking at the entire Cenozoic today, 65 million years ago, or even far back as 95 million years ago. And the, the altered nature of the sediment also allows us to look at how sediment interacts with ocean chemistry and what that means for climate and ocean chemistry. So the, the project I'll be talking about today is published in Nature Communications in this publication. I've done a lot of work since then, but uh, for this talk and this audience, I thought this would be the most interesting. So I'm excited to be presenting this today. And I'll touch upon a few ongoing projects that have stemmed from this work uh, at the end. So to start us off, we're gonna, we're gonna look at one of the, a big geologic mystery in Earth's past. Uh, why did the Earth cool over the past 50 million years? So on the x-axis here, we have age of millions of years ago. On the left is the present. And on the y-axis is a comp, uh, delta-18 oxygen isotopes record from benthic foraminifera uh, looked at over time. So this delta-18O is affected by sea ice volume and temperature. But if you remove the effect of sea ice, broadly, uh, there, the right axis shows the ice-free temperature recorded by this proxy. So there's been a decrease in temperature from 50 million years ago when we were a greenhouse to more today where we have ice sheets in the polar regions and what we call an ice house. So this cooling has broadly been linked to a decrease in atmospheric CO2. So the top plot has the same x-axis and estimates of atmospheric CO2 concentrations from a variety of proxies that widely disagree with one another. But overall, there is show, there's shown a decrease in carbon dioxide uh, over the Cenozoic. So then the question becomes, why did carbon dioxide decrease over the past 50 million years? So there's many hypotheses as to why carbon dioxide decreased. One hypothesis uh, says that there's decreased seafloor spreading. So there's less volcanic outgassing from the Earth's mantle, and that has caused uh, a decrease in atmospheric CO2. However, if you look at the estimates of the rate of ocean spreading rates, uh, they, 
there's a whole bunch of estimates. Some say it's increasing, some say it's decreasing, some say it's remained constant. So jury is still out on exactly what ocean spreading rates and volcanic outgassing uh, did over this time period. Another hypothesis is that there is increased photosynthesis and the photosynthesis drew CO2 out of the atmosphere and increased the amount of organic matter buried in the ocean. But exactly where and how this massive amount of organic matter is buried in the seafloor uh, is still um, not totally figured out. There's still questions surrounding that. And a third hypothesis is that there is an increase in silicate weathering over the Cenozoic that holds CO2 out of the atmosphere. And so there's popular hypothesis like the uplift weathering hypothesis, or you can increase the weatherability of continents uh, and uh, increase silicate weathering, which will draw down CO2. So there are some issues with this hypothesis also that I will get into shortly. Um, but broadly, all of these hypotheses uh, kind of have thorns in the side of them. So there's room still for other processes that may be affecting this global uh, CO2 decrease. And that's what I'll be talking about today is another hypothesis. Before I get into the silicate weathering hypothesis and this other hypothesis, I wanted to point out one other trend in uh, that happened over the Cenozoic. In this plot, we have age of millions of years on the x-axis and the uh, magnesium calcium ratio of seawater on the y-axis. And uh, broadly, a variety of uh, archives have suggested that the magnesium calcium of seawater has increased uh, two to threefold. And that is likely due to an increase in the magnesium concentration of seawater. So this is another map or another plot with the same x-axis. And then on the y-axis is magnesium concentrations of seawater. And models of magnesium isotopes uh, in Higgins and Schrag 2015 uh, and the concentrations of magnesium suggest a three teramol per year change that's related to the silica cycle. So the other option would be that you change the carbonate cycle that changes the magnesium and calcium uh, properties, but the magnesium isotope suggests that it's a change in the silicate cycle. So since this is related to the silicate cycle and the silicate weathering hypothesis is related to the silicate uh, silicates, let's dive into that a little bit deeper. So the increase in silicate weathering hypothesis that is thought to have decreased CO2 goes like this. You have carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, it combines with water to form carbonic acid. That carbonic acid rains out or interacts with silicate minerals, such as like in any typical rock, and weathers away by carbonates, magnesium, potassium, sodium ions, and silicic acid. And all of those get washed out through rivers to the sea, leaving behind a degraded clay mineral. So this is a, a weathering reaction that you may have learned about in various classes. Um, and uh, that is how you get CO2 from the atmosphere into the ocean. And so the, the hypothesis that you can uplift mountains to increase the amount of weathering that happens, or you can change the weatherability or where your continents are positioned. There's lots of ways you could possibly get an increase in silicate weathering to decrease CO2. Um, but one, one kind of thorn in the side of this hypothesis that uh, complicates this idea is that if you increase the rate of silicate weathering and decrease CO2 and cool the earth, uh, the initial chemical weathering of silicates uh, is temperature dependent. And so if you cool the earth, you can actually decrease silicate weathering uh, and kind of dampen the effect of this process and like slow it down. The other issue with this hypothesis is that if you increase silicate weathering, you're going to increase the amount of bicarbonates that are deposited in the ocean. And if you continue, if you just increase, you turn the lever for silicate weathering and just increase it with nothing else changing, you're going to completely deplete the atmosphere of carbon dioxide within a couple million years. So you can't just turn up and like silicate weathering and have nothing else change. You have to have something that's returning. Uh, CO2 back to the atmosphere and establish a new steady state. So the question is like, what changed 
aside from increasing silicate weathering to maintain the steady state. And so um, to look at that question, we're gonna take it back. We're gonna zoom out a bit and look at big ocean budgets and like where, where do the carbonate, like where do bicarbonates go? Like what, what is, what, where do all these elements from weathering go? So in 1960s, McCarroll and Genzi, or McKenzie and Garrels uh, did a giant mass balance calculation of river inputs and uh, ocean outputs, <laughs> trying to figure out balance, like where everything that's coming in is going out. So flux is in, have to equal flux is out. And they did it for all of these ions. And they were able to put a lot of the bicarbonates and, or all the calcium and some of the bicarbonates went into carbonates. So that took care of calcium. Some of the magnesium went into carbonates and took care of that. Uh, and most of the silica could go into opal, like biogenic silica. So that took care of that. But there is still a lot of magnesium left that was unaccounted for with no supposed sink, along with potassium and, and sodium. So the question was like, well, where did those elements go? <laughs> and so in order to balance this budget and figure out where these elements are going, they hypothesized a reaction that they called reverse weathering. So reverse weathering is the exact opposite of the weathering reaction we went over a couple of slides ago. We have bicarbonates in the ocean, magnesium, potassium, sodium ions in the ocean that combines with reactive silica, so perhaps some biogenic silica, and a reactive aluminum, maybe from rivers or dust or volcanic ash. Uh, and all of these can combine to form a new orthogenic clay mineral. So the cation is being taken up into a clay mineral and the bicarbonate is being converted back to CO2. And so this kind of reverses what the weathering reaction does and it is able to account for the uptake of these cations into the seafloor. And there's been a lot of work that has been done since uh, Mackenzie and Garrels, and hydrothermal vents were discovered, which introduced a huge sink of many elements. Uh, but to this day, reverse weathering or some kind of low temperature uh, orthogenic process remains a very necessary part of all of these element ocean budgets. So this is still like an important process. Uh, it's the, um, yes. And in terms of balancing an increase in silicate weathering, uh, this is a quote from a paper by Kump et al. in 2000, where they were looking at what might balance uh, an increase in silicate weathering or, or other ocean processes. And they said, if, an, if the ocean is indeed buffered with vast amounts of orthogenic clays, then substantial imbalance in the carbon cycle could be compensated for by adjustments in the cation content of clays. So I like this quote because it seems like he's a little skeptical, like if indeed it's buffered, but, uh, but also uh, really points to the importance of this orthogenic clay sink in, in terms of balancing the carbon cycle on a global scale. And so this is one of the ways reverse weathering or this cation uptake into clays is one of the mechanisms that a well-known paper by Raymond Rudiman uh, suggested balancing um, their budget. So Raymond Rudiman are, I guess it's a, a famous paper for uplift weathering, you uplift the Himalayans, increase silicate weathering. And they knew that they needed something to uh, balance the uh, input of bicarbonates to like maintain a new steady state. So in their paper, they say that, oh, if you increase the amount of bicarbonates and ions from uh, silicate weathering, then you'll form more orthogenic clays and CO2 will be returned to the atmosphere and you will uh, balance your budget. However, everyone, uh, these papers all kind of wave their arms and be like, yeah, there's probably clays down there. <laughs> They're probably doing something. Um, but it, these clays have kind of remained really elusive because it, they're so hard to identify. They look an awful lot like you know, other clay minerals in the ocean that aren't orthogenic. Uh, they can get diluted by a lot of biogenic material. So actually finding evidence for the sink is exceedingly difficult. Um, there has been 
Oh yeah, and the other thing I want to point out is they they said if you increase bicarbonates, you'll get more clays. The few studies that have identified clays in uh, near the Amazon Delta or in the Southern Ocean uh, have shown that uh, reactive silica is actually what's limiting the formation of these clays uh, in most of the world's ocean. So there's bicarbonates everywhere. That's easy to find, but silica is undersaturated in the ocean. And so if you added more silica to many parts of the seafloor, you have all these other components that you need. And so you can form a new clay mineral. Uh, so reactive silica is actually like the limiting reactant in this process. The only place that's not true is in the Southern Ocean or other silica rich uh, sediment deposits. So their hypothesis uh, that this will just balance it might not work exactly because silica can limit this reaction. And I mentioned before that the, these clays are very, very hard to identify. Um, there has been SEM images and some pore water, a lot of pore water evidence for them, but actually figuring out how much of these cations are taken up into these clays uh, is, is quite challenging. So that's what we'll do today. <laughs> uh, today, uh, in this talk, for the rest of the talk, I'm gonna go over two methods we use to identify these clays magnesium isotopes and multivariate statistical models. And then we'll extrapolate our results to a global scale and see how important this authogenic clay sink is that we, are, we identified. And then we will uh, move into talking about a hypothesis that reverse weathering uh, changed and that may have decreased the atmospheric CO2 and uh, increased magnesium calcium over the Cenozoic. And so that's our roadmap. <laughs> So to start off, uh, we're going to go where there is a very high concentration of orthogenic minerals. And we're going to go about as far away from land as you can get in the South Pacific gyre. So this background map is chlorophyll concentrations, which is a proxy for primary productivity. And the South Pacific gyre, oh, these are the seven sites that I uh, had analyzed or have analyzed. And today we'll be talking about this site in the circle in red. And this purple area in the map is some of the lowest chlorophyll concentrations in the world. Uh, and so this is where primary productivity is extremely low, which means there's very little biogenic material to dilute our oxygenic clays. There's also very little dust. Uh, this is a NASA aerosol simulation of uh, yeah, a global aerosol simulation by NASA that. Uh, where all that we really want to look at right now is the red or the orangish color, which represents dust. So the Northern Hemisphere has orders of magnitude higher dust fluxes than the Southern Hemisphere, where Australia is the biggest source of dust, but it still is not very much. So out in the middle of the gyre, very little dust. So with little biological material and little bit of dust, uh, the South Pacific gyre has some of the clearest waters in the world and extremely slow sedimentation rates. I think these sharks were uh, like 14 or 15 feet long and they could see them like all the way down in the ocean when they were like this big, like at depth. <laughs> and then they were like, oh, it's a little fish. And then it swam up and it was like a massive shark. <laughs> so it just the visibility is unbeautiful. <laughs> oh yeah, and I guess another uh, thing, uh, Sedimentation rates here are about one meter per million years. So on our time scales, that's about one micron per year. And I want you to think about that next time you sweep under your bed because dust definitely accumulates there faster than it does in the South Pacific gyre. Um, <laughs> uh, so very, very, very slow uh, accumulation rates. So the sites in this study were collected during the Integrated Ocean Drilling Program, now the International Ocean Discovery Program project uh, in the South Pacific Gyre, uh, Expedition 329. Uh, it was the, the cruise was targeting microbiology. So what kind of life lives in these extreme remote environments? Uh, it was co-chiefed by Steve Dant and uh, Fumio Inagaki-san and my PhD advisor, Rick Murray was on there. Um, and the type of sediment that they recovered predominantly looks like this, very, very hard to date, to, to see any different mineralogy, mineralogical changes, because it's all been altered. 
uh, but chemically, we found it to be quite diverse. And so we just, we took this sediment, dissolved all of it in uh, various techniques, flux fusion, acid digestions, uh, and analyzed it for magnesium isotopes. And then I'll get into the second method. But the first method, magnesium isotopes. Uh, here at the bottom, I have the delta notation for magnesium isotopes. Uh, but all that you need to remember for this talk is that there are lab and poor water studies that suggest that orthogenic clays, so when magnesium gets taken up into an orthogenic clay, it preferentially takes up the heavier magnesium isotope. So heavy magnesium isotope, probably an orthogenic clay. That's all you need to take away from this slide. So if we look at our data from site 1366 in the South Pacific gyre, on the y-axis, we have depth in meters below seafloor. Uh, for reference, this is drilled down to basalt and it is 95 million year old basalt. So they have 30 meters of sediment accumulate in 90 million years. <laughs> very, very, very slow. Um, and then on the x-axis is the magnesium isotopes that we'll look at for the site. So if our samples had magnesium isotope signatures of seawater, they should plot near this purple band. Uh, and if they have the magnesium isotope signature of continental material or dust, uh, they should plot near this band or in this band. And the data from 1366 show that near the top, it does plot within this green band. There's probably a lot of dust here. Uh, we have a couple of outliers that maybe there is a lot of seawater that was still in that sample when we dried it down and uh, analyzed it. Uh, but all of these samples have magnesium isotopes that are heavier than continental material. And we can interpret that. There's not much else that would explain this aside from uh, an uptake of magnesium into an orthogenic clay mineral. So this is a beautiful few samples that are like have almost exclusively orthogenic material that is undiluted by biological material and all the other stuff and uh, is taking up, potentially taking up magnesium. Now, this tells us like, okay, we probably have magnesium uptake into clay, but like how much? We can't really use this to quantify the magnitude of uh, magnesium taken up. So for that, we turn to uh, our second method, which is quantifying the mass fraction of six sediment sources into the clay. So we're gonna take this brown homogeneous looking clay and tell you how what percentage of each of these end members is in this clay. So these are all the components that mixed to make this. And I'll get more into them later. But our first step is to analyze a sediment, like I said, using inductively coupled plasma emission spectrometry or inductively coupled mass spectrometry. We analyzed 50 element concentrations at about 2% precision for about 200 samples at the seven sites. The elements we analyzed are highlighted in yellow. And if we just look at two elements for now, on the x-axis, we have titanium concentrations. On the y-axis, we have magnesium concentrations. Uh, these black symbols are reference materials. So like average basalt, uh, I think this is a mid-ocean ridge basalt and an average ocean island basalt, they should plot up here. Uh, average continental material will plot around here. And a rhyolitic or a more felsic volcanic ash would plot around here. And if our samples were a mixture of just basalt being diluted by other components that were not aluminosilicates, they should plot along this line. If they were dust being diluted by, let's say, calcium carbonates or another component, they should plot along this line. And if they were a mixture, they should plot in between these two red lines. Uh, I should also state the green symbols are from our site 1366. And you can see that there is a big enrichment in magnesium that can't be explained by any of these end members that you typically find in the ocean. So this is a, our first hint that like, hmm, maybe there is a lot of magnesium being taken up into these sediment that can't be explained by uh, detrital sources. Uh, but again, it's a, from this plot, it's like a little hard to tell like how much. Oh, we did analyze, there were some like uh, altered volcanic ash layers. And this was one of those layers uh, that we're gonna call a magnesium enriched ash or magnesium ash. And it did could serve as an end member to explain uh, this 
uh, these samples over here. So to quantify how much magnesium uh, is taken up and to kind of look at the holistic picture of what's happening in these sediments, we did a variety of multivariate statistical techniques that were specifically honed for uh, the geochemistry of marine sediment. So um, line emphasized diamond teeth and they're like have developed these codes over time. Uh, uh, my, my PhD advisor, Rick Murray, did his postdoc with Margaret Linen and then brought these statistics into his group. And now I've been carrying the torch to continue the use of these techniques. Uh, they've been extremely helpful for these types of sediment where it's hard to pull apart different sources when it all looks the same. So the first technique we're going to talk about is cumulative factor analysis. Uh, and cumulative factor analysis is beautiful because you just give it a data set and it objectively identifies how many components and what kind of components it can statistically differentiate. So we call this an objective unmixing of a uh, data set. And what it's doing is looking at where how elements co-vary throughout the samples, and then it groups the elements into factors, which we can interpret as n members. So this was the first step we did, and it helped us recognize like how many uh, sediment components we should be looking for and the approximate composition. But then we took that information and uh, found known published values in the literature of different end members and put that in a constrained least square multiple linear regression model, where this one, you take the known end members and you try and remix them in various proportions to recreate your data set. And so you're trying to minimize the difference between your model and the measured data set by mixing known end members. And this technique determines how much of each end member is in each sample. And so that is where we can get a quantitative mass fraction of each of these end members in the sample. So these are the results from uh, a whole lot of modeling and sensitivity testing and robustness testing. Uh, so here in this plot, we again have depth in meters below sea floor. And on the x-axis, we have the modeled mass fraction. So 0% of the sediment is here, 100% of the sediment is here. And then each sample is broken down into these various components. So uh, each of these components tells a very interesting story. Uh, dust, we can look at how dust fluxes have changed to the South Pacific gyre over time. Uh, this orange part, this is a big hydrothermal sequence that was deposited on top of the basalt. Uh, so I have other work looking more at uh, the metal cycling in this region and uh, looking at um, this metal, the metal oxides in this component. But today, oh, and all of this like metal cycling and dust stuff you can read about in other publications. But today for this talk, uh, I wanna focus on this purple, the purple component, which is that magnesium enriched altered ash that we saw in the two dimensional plot. I tried hundreds of thousands, thousands and thousands of models. And this end member consistently came up as being a very important part of this sediment. And uh, you can see it's almost in every uh, sediment that this is a thing. So this is the mass fraction of the magnesium enriched altered ash. Uh, okay, so this, this end member we know has mag like enriched magnesium and we can like quantify how much should be in the ash because we like it broadly, the elements that don't change would suggest it's a rhyolite. So we have an idea of like how much magnesium should be there. And then we can calculate how much extra magnesium is there. So we can like quantify how much excess magnesium is there. But can we like really show that that was, well, but yeah, anyways, so th this also suggests it. So let's compare this to our first method. So on this plot, on the x-axis, we have that data from the previous slide the magnesium enriched altered ash mass fraction. And we're plotting it against the magnesium isotopes from the first method. And although not perfect, it is a significant correlation between uh, these two techniques. So as more of this magnesium ash fraction is in the samples, you have a heavier magnesium isotope, uh, suggesting that that enrichment of magnesium into this ash is corresponding with the heavier magnesium isotopes that we already kind of thought were from 
uh, seawater. And so the agreement of these techniques suggests that the volcanic ash precursor mineral uh, did take up magnesium from seawater and formed a new clay. So there's very solid evidence that magnesium is being taken up into at least these sediments. So far, right, so, so far, the take home points are that the South Pacific Dryer has concentrated orthogenic clays, which are a great asset for looking at orthogenic processes. <laughs> uh, we are able to fingerprint magnesium uptake into clays using uh, the isotopes and uh, identify it as a volcanic ash precursor mineral in the open ocean using the other elements and quantify the amount of magnesium taken up with all of the modeling work. So we're like, okay, we found some orthogenic clays. How big is this on like a global scale? So we took our core top samples or near modern samples and extrapolated it to a global scale. So uh, clays are the predominant lithology for like 30 to 50% of the ocean floor. They're all over the place. So we were like, oh, this has got to be huge, right? It's, it's uh, you know, we did all the density corrections and like our concentrations and how much magnesium we knew was taken up, ex you know, expanded it to the globe and found that uh, it accounts for 1% <laughs> of the magnesium coming into the ocean, <laughs> which like, regardless of how you tweak the levers, like it wasn't big. <laughs> And so I was kind of like, oh, that's disappointing, but uh, not disappointing. You learn something. <laughs> uh, this, this is for the open ocean. There has been other work looking at reverse weathering along the continental margins or like right where rivers come out where you also have a lot of silica and they could, you could have a lot more reverse weathering uh, right along the coastline. So this number is only for the open ocean. And we're like, okay, well maybe more of it's happening near the coasts. Um, but then we were we were looking at our data and thinking about the silica patterns. And I mentioned earlier that silica in today's ocean is undersaturated with respect to silica. So a lot of the ocean doesn't have a lot of the ocean floor did not have excess silica. But um, in the past, it was different. So this is today's uh, biogenic silica concentrations in the surface sediment. Uh, and you can see that the darker green means it has more silica on the seafloor. So the Southern Ocean, plenty of silica here, probably enough silica, but most of the, the gyres have no silica. Um, and so this is the distribution of silica on the seafloor today. In the past, so 50 million years ago, there has been chert deposited, there's, there's chert that's been discovered from these older yeah, that were deposited 15 million years ago. So chert is a diagenetic silica rock. So it, it is after your biogenic silica goes through a series of alteration products, you get chert. But broadly, if there's chert, there was silica <laughs> is all that we really need to know for this. And almost there's huge swaths of the North Atlantic that were covered in, that have been covered in chert and dated to be around 50 million years ago. And um, broadbands in the Pacific Ocean, and uh, just chert from 50 million years ago is identified in many, many ocean basins, suggesting that the distribution of silica was very different 50 million years ago. And the study by Mutoni and Kent that was looking at all these chert layers, they tried to accommodate for all the spatial biases and, and whatever, and stacked up uh, all of the chert layers they found. So this is aging millions of years ago, and this is like the number of chert intervals in gray, and then red is the sum of chert intervals, which you know could be adjusted by based on statistics. But broadly, they found that the most chert was deposited 50 million years ago. There's a lot of chert layers from 50 million years ago, and then after that, it decreased. So this just this suggests a dramatic reorganization of the silica cycle from 50 million years ago to today. So if we're gonna reorganize the geographic distribution of silica on the seafloor, uh, that is going to decrease the mixing of reactive silica and aluminum on the seafloor. So let's say 50 million years ago, we had silica everywhere, very easy to mix with aluminum and all the other metals and make new clays. Over the Cenozoic, everything got concentrated into the Southern Ocean or the Equatorial Pacific or high latitudes, uh, which 
that concentration kind of moving it all down to the southern ocean stopped as much mixing of reactive silica and aluminum. So this could have, this separation could have reduced the global formation of orthogenic clays, which if we're reducing the clay sink, we're gonna decrease the removal of seawater magnesium, which could potentially increase seawater magnesium calcium ratios. And uh, we took a sample that was farther back that had more orthogenic clay minerals that would be more representative. It's, there's like porcelainite in it in, the, in these samples from um, in, our, in our site. There's silica rich intervals. Took the data from that and extrapolated that across the regions of the ocean that we thought would have chert or um, like silica being deposited on the seafloor and staying there, preserved on the seafloor too. And when we did that extrapolation, it was on the order of magnitude to explain the three teramol per year change in magnesium. So we had 1% of the open ocean today, but potentially enough magnesium uh, in the past taking up into these clays. So that might explain these plots. <laughs> Additionally, if we have a reduction of global orthogenic clay formation, it would cause increased alkalinity because we're not removing, you know, we're not changing that bicarbonate back to CO2. And a reduction in that CO2 would translate uh, through equilibrium to a decrease in atmospheric CO2, which would cool the earth. And the, and the cool thing about this hypothesis is that if you cool the earth, like the other ones, we need an, another system to change, to balance and make a new steady state. So if you cool the earth, uh, a cooler earth temperature dependent weathering will decrease weathering until the alkalinity sources equal the sink. So through this way, through the, by saying that a cooling earth will decrease silicate weathering on land, it uh, kind of balances, makes a new steady state um, by starting with a change in clay formation on the seafloor. And if we assume that there's a three teramol per year uh, increase in um, the magnesium cycle, uh, that would translate to a corresponding like doubling of PCO2 from the modern day to 50 million years ago. And that's um, within a range, I guess, of the wide variety of uh, estimates of atmospheric CO2 uh, that we um, looked at in that initial plot. So it's, it's within the range that it could be uh, significant enough to explain the CO2. And so broadly, just to recap, the ocean floor is starting to change but through this change in silica distributions and it's leading to uh, global cooling. So the big take home message here is that deep sea orthogenic clay formation is not a big sink of magnesium today, probably due to limited silica availability, but it could have been far bigger in this past. And this, the change from the past to the present could be responsible for uh, the change in atmospheric CO2. So, you know, I don't think I'm gonna claim that this is the only thing happening. <laughs> But it's a fourth hypothesis, in addition to the three uh, of ways that we could get this atmospheric uh, CO2 decrease. And I guess, so that's kind of the conclusion of this hypothesis. Uh, ongoing work that has stemmed from this, um, then projects that I'm involved in include, uh, can we do this for potassium? Where's the potassium going? <laughs> I was hoping it'd be as, as uh, you know, I could just do the same thing that I did with magnesium, but it's not that easy, but we're getting there. <laughs> uh, how do volcanic ash and the carbon cycle interact in different diagenetic environments? So when there's a really methane rich environment, what's happening there between volcanic ash and the carbon cycle? Uh, is there evidence of reverse weathering in seawater? So one of my colleagues that's modeling um, seawater carbon cycle uh, is, um, there's, well, we haven't published this yet, but we'll get there eventually. Uh, we're looking for evidence of reverse weathering uh, coming from, in the, in the carbon cycle coming from a uh, sediment sink. 
And uh, this, these oxic marine sediments are a big sink for a lot of different metals. And so there's metal isotopes that are being developed as paleoproxies uh, and being applied to early earth and uh, paleo records without having a great idea of how it works in the modern day. So we've been looking at how these oxic uh, type of clays that cover 30 to 50% of the seafloor uh, and the impact they're having on metal isotopes. I mentioned that big hydrothermal sequence at the bottom of the uh, site, and that's led to work looking at the distribution of hydrothermal metal deposition. And then also we have uh, one paper out and another one coming out hopefully soon. Uh, about the marine iron cycle and looking at the different sources of iron and how those have changed over time. And with that, I would like to acknowledge um, my, uh, my PhD work and postdoc work with colleagues at Boston University, University of Rhode Island. I guess Rick is now at Huey, but whatever. Uh, Princeton, yeah. <laughs> I didn't, oh, whatever. <laughs> uh, Princeton University, um, Danielle is now at Rutgers, who is a co-author on this study. And then my colleagues at Woods Hole uh, that are current collaborators. And of course, none of this would be possible without funding from NSF and none of these samples would exist. And all of these records that I showed you today wouldn't exist without the International Ocean Discovery Program. So thank you. <laughs> that was a really cool talk, Anne, thank you. Um, we have plenty of time for questions. Uh, Constantinus preparing the cube. <laughs> so um yeah great talk um um so what reduces the amount of well you phrased it as a geographic reorganization of the silica rather than a reduction in the amount of the silica what's controlling that geographic reorganization this is a great question and when we published i purposefully tried to evade it and be like uh we don't know but it did reorganize <laughs> uh it, it's a great question i think there's Hypotheses that with the opening of the ocean gateways, because like South America and Australia used to be connected to Antarctica, which meant very different circulation patterns. There was no uh, Southern Ocean like we know it today. Um, so perhaps the opening of those gateways and the reorganization of ocean currents uh, caused it. Uh, there's also a dramatic shift from predominantly radiolarians as the dominant silica um, organism to diatoms. Uh, so the evolution of diatoms and where they're adapted to thrive may have influenced it also. Uh, and also like, uh, like, yeah, just like silica distributions in general and where those like starting with the nutrients and having nutrients be redistributed and then uh, kind of reinforcing itself with the biological changes. So I, I'm not sure, but uh, Thanks. It definitely did change. Yeah. <laughs> We're in the middle of this global experiment where CO2 is going up again. And uh, obviously it's happening very quickly, but very recently. Uh, is there an element of this you could check looking at, at, at modern rates? And could any of this, could any of what you're doing here apply to looking at very, very recent reactions? Uh, yeah, so a lot of the evidence that kind of like ramped up reverse weathering as an idea was on uh, Amazon, like the Amazon Delta, like Delta systems, continental margin. So those are all much faster processes. And the studies in lab that have tried synthesizing these types of autogenic clays, it doesn't take very long. It's like weeks, I guess. Um, and so they do they can potentially have an impact on on more human time scales as well. Um, uh, I've been thinking about this a little bit in terms of uh, like carbon storage techniques, either like if you're increased weathering on land as a way to remove CO2, like how much reverse weathering happens once it gets to the ocean, <laughs> or can we inject CO2 into the seafloor, react with uh, volcanic, like in weather volcanic ash, and how much of that is actually weathered versus reverse weathered if, in that process. So. I'm not sure I fully answered your question. No, I, 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 and I don't know, <laughs> I, I, but it, it strikes me that we're in this major shift right now, mm -hmm. but it's small relative to across the Cenozoic, but still uh, some of this has got to bear 
on, on the planets responding to big changes in chemistry. Mm -hmm. So anyway, thank you. Big throw. Yeah. Enjoyed the talk very much. Uh, you mentioned ocean gateways. I was going to bring that up. It seems like you, <clears throat> by just uh, ignoring them, you sort of dismiss, dismissed the, the old Kennett hypothesis and about the opening of the southern gateways. Oh, I think they're incredibly important. I didn't mean to seem dismissive. <laughs> but strongly related to that is what, in your view, would cause the rapid decrease in temperature in the Miocene? There, there is a, a hypothesis about that in the in the in the good gateway story mm -hmm. from the Scotia Sea. But how how would you increase that rate of descent into the ice house? Yeah. Um, uh, I okay. Well, I did want to reiterate that the the gateway opening clearly had significant changes on ocean chemistry, climate and everything. So I don't think, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna dismiss anything. It definitely probably played into it and could have like played into this hypothesis of reorganizing it or in the way that uh, is suggested by that hypothesis. <laughs> so I'm not, I'm not gonna dismiss it or throw it out. I don't, I don't actually dismiss or throw out any of the other ones. I'm just suggesting another one. <laughs> Thank you. Who's going? Thanks. Thanks for your great talk. Um, I'm still trying to understand the dynamics of the composition of deep pelagic clay. So I understand that these clays they precipitate, possibly triggered, for example, by by ashes or dust. I was wondering if it also necessarily then binds uh, these these elements such as chlorine, magnesium, uh, potassium that otherwise would stay uh, dissolved in the oceans. Yeah, so the the chlorine story, I uh, I I know very little about. <laughs> uh, the potassium story is a little bit more interesting because we ran potassium isotopes on these same sediment, and I was hoping that they would correlate with the other ash that's in there and be like, oh, this one took up magnesium, this one took up ash, yay! But it there's zero correlation, <laughs> uh, so that has kind of forced us to look at um, other scenarios. I think one of the issues with the South Pacific gyre sediment is a lot of the ash is more felsic or like closer to a rhyolite composition, which naturally has a lot of potassium. So an uptake in potassium in already pretty potassium rich sediment uh, is very challenging. <laughs> uh, in some of the other ocean sediment I've been looking at that are, are less rhyolitic and maybe more anisitic and stuff, you can, um, it might be easier to identify or, or they've had a lot of success like looking at potassium isotopes in basalt and looking at uh, the weathering or uptake of potassium into basalt and tracking that with uh, potassium isotopes. So can't speak to chlorine, but potassium we're working on, it's not a one-for-one -one, uh, way of applying the methods. <laughs> Thank you. So, Benjamin Kiesling asks, or he says, first of all, thank you for your talk, and then asks, you mentioned that some of the critical elements in this reverse weathering process come from rivers. I'm wondering what role hemispheric and global scale glaciation might have played in driving changes to this process. I know dating the sediments is difficult, but so you see any changes in your record associated with known changes in global ice volume and therefore weathering and erosion, for example, the mid-Miocene Pliocene Pleistocene transition, mid-Pleistocene transition, for example. Uh, yeah, Wing great question. Um, so the sediment where I'm talking about, definitely not rivering, uh, it's all windblown or, uh, like maybe submarine volcanoes, uh, contributed to it. Um, uh, so I can't really speak to the rivering. Uh, it's also pretty hard to date, like the exact, uh, like boundaries. We have done, I've done cobalt models and osmium models to date these clays and there's like a couple of other age constraints, but uh, it's difficult. Like I said at the beginning, these are long records that can cover the whole Cenozoic, but you can't really get like, here's the Miocene boundary. But broadly, we can see that. Um, that would have to, we would have to look at different sites and kind of do global analyses of like where the silica is at that time. Uh, and uh, yeah, where, where it has been. 
I don't have a great answer for that. I'm just sort of saying things that are related. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. But it, it's an interesting to topic, and I'd love to speak with you more about, about it. <laughs> Other online question. Um, so, uh, Ozereni Ogyasoba, I'm sorry if I messed it up, asks, um, if atmospheric CO2 has been decreasing and still is, then why are we talking about global warming because of increase in CO2? <laughs> They call it yeah. <laughs> um, so I think about like CO2 in the atmosphere as like, like every, all these carbon reservoirs are responding on different time scales. And so like the seafloor sediment in the ocean are responding way slower than like, like, I don't know, photosynthesis or like land um, like things. Uh, but for the modern increase in CO2, we're taking a reservoir that is really supposed to be stored long-term and making it go quickly into the atmosphere way more fast than it should be. And so taking something that's supposed to be reacting really slowly with earth and putting it into a reservoir that's rapidly reacting uh, has not been done previously in Earth's climate. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's we we humans have grown accustomed to living in an ice house world, and we might we'll probably get out of that soon. <laughs> at this rate, I have a question that's kind of related to Benjamin's. Um, so you said when you were drilling, you had this thirty meters, which was really slow accumulation over a ninety-five million year old. Uh, oceanic seafloor. So can you combine like plate tectonic reconstructions to kind of see like a pathway of where these things might have had like fluxes coming in from? Yeah. So um there's convenient you asked. Perfect. There's a, <laughs> oops. So actually I can point to it here. This is the site that we are uh, talking about here. So it started over here when the mid ocean ridge was farther over, and then it's moved over there. So you can see Australia migrating north, South America migrating north, and the colors are the age of the ocean lithosphere. So the red is the youngest seafloor, and the blue and purples are older. So it started over. So it's born. So, it, so you can kind of, there are studies that try and model ocean circulation. 50 million years ago, and they have some of them have like subpolar gyres. There's a, there's a lot of contention around what the ocean currents are doing, <laughs> I think. And um, but broadly, it's moving that way. So it is getting closer to Australia. Um, well, that, that's the whole dust story. But yeah, I can. What was your exact question on this? <laughs> I mean, yeah, just kind of that, and then I guess you can also see how like the that first section of hydrothermal possible mm -hmm. stuff really comes from huge spreading ridges yeah cool. yeah there's also this is uh in the modern day like called the osborne trough but it was an active spreading ridge uh also that these sites kind of were in between these two ridges so this hydrothermal material could have been coming from there or there but then this ridge went extinct um right around when we see like a drop off in hydrothermal material so that's my hypothesis as to why there's a bunch of hydrothermal material there That was a great talk. Um, I'm curious, just because it seems like it's going to really matter for this story. The have we has there been some thought about the distribution of really large scale rivers and thus the delta generation for the purpose of this reverse weathering component? I don't. Um, I haven't seen those studies. Uh, it doesn't mean they don't exist, um, but that would be interesting. And just and if there's a magnitude in that, then that that seems. Yeah, there there's recent silica budgets that um, like invoke a reverse weathering like component to it, like to balance the silica budgets, and they're all they also state that it happens near the coasts. So that would be interesting, and I, I don't know what the paleo delta component looks like either. Quick follow-up. Yeah. So my and my second question was uh, on this transition from I guess the radial layers to diatoms question. From the standpoint of your orthogenic clays, 
is one preferred over the other for generating a sink? Um, so if you look at uh, like images, like zoomed up of the diatoms or radiolarians, the clays like can often form in like the pore space where you can really concentrate silica. So if there's like more or like, yeah, what do you call it? The, like divots, like the, they're almost enclosed uh, in the, the silica. Um, I, I'm not sure if one's like more conducive than that. That would be the only thing I think of like the physiological differences. Um, for, uh, yeah, I, I typically think about it more like a solubility difference. So if there's, if there's a solubility difference between them, there might be. Uh, the better preservation or the longer they can stay on the seafloor, the more likely, I guess, there is to make a clay because <laughs> most of like silicon on the seafloor gets dissolved away. Um, I know these clays forming around these diatoms or radiolarians can reduce the solubility of them. So you also change the solubility as you make clay minerals around them, um, which helps them stay on the seafloor. Uh, but specifically between radiolarians, and diatoms physiologically, I'm not sure. Yeah, that, that's those are my thoughts on the topic. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, I have one too. Um, so thinking about like modern climate change and um, you know, often silicate weathering is the thing that gets talked about as like on geologic time scales, the thing that'll bring us back to pre-industrial CO2 values. Um, and if uh, reverse weathering is operating in opposition to that, and it's, uh, I was just trying to work it out in my head just now, when you're talking about that earlier, it's, it's, there's more reverse weathering when it's warming, right? I'm not sure there's been enough studies to say that it actually right. happens, but uh, uh, the controls on, Reverse weathering, I don't think they're launched. I was saying for weathering. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Like yeah, yeah. Weathering. yeah. So I was, so I guess, but my question is uh, on a broader scale, like, so what, what will the role of reverse weathering be in that long-term drawdown of atmospheric CO2 after the anthropogenic pulse? Um, is it going to make it longer or is there going to be like extra cooling that happens afterwards or what do you think? That's a great question. Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> I mean, the, the reverse weathering and its like implications on like climate are not well understood, yeah. right? like right now. So right. Oh, that's what's exciting about like a new thing, like a new a new part of your system to quantify, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. yeah, cool. Okay. Well, if there are no further questions, um, we will be going uh, to happy hour at Austin Beer Works around four, and everyone is welcome to join us there. They of course have a roof and walls, so we won't be outside in the cold rain. Um, and there's still a couple slots for dinner if anybody else would like to join us for dinner tonight um, at around 5, 5.30, something like that. So thank you all again. And thank you, Anne, for coming. This is a great talk. Thank you for having me.